Trump care. The House hands the president his first major victory in Congress. The ayes are 217, the nays are 213. The bill is passed. To start repealing and replacing Obamacare. This is a great plan. I actually think it will get even better. But are Senate Republicans on board? The Senate will write its own bill. That's clear. Will the House bill be dead on arrival? Health and Human Services Secretary Dr. Tom Price joins us live. And Democrats' next move. The minority party issues a warning to their colleagues across the aisle on health care. You have every provision of this bill tattooed on your forehead. You will glow in the dark on this one. And even taunts Republicans on the House floor. Could this cost Republicans control of Congress? Plus Hillary Clinton taking stock and pointing fingers. I was on the way to winning until the combination of Jim Comey's letter and Russian WikiLeaks and plotting her next move. I'm now back to being an activist citizen and uh, part of the resistance. Could she be setting up a ground game for another run? The best political minds will be here on What Happens Next. Hello, I'm Dick Tapper in Washington, where the state of our union is in a state of flux. We're watching as potentially big changes take place both at home and abroad, voting is underway in France after a turbulent campaign there where far-right candidate Marine Le Pen is hoping to ride a populist wave into the French presidency. She is challenging center-left candidate Emmanuel Macron, whose campaign saw the results of a last-minute email hacking published on Friday. The winner will lead a nation that has a serious jobs crisis and try to chart a new path on trade and globalization. I believe the French have a term for it. I believe they call it Deja vu. Here in the U.S., Republicans and Democrats are both looking forward to the next front in the battle over health care legislation, the U.S. Senate. As House Republicans celebrated the health care bill passed on Thursday, Democrats immediately got to work to try to target vulnerable members who voted for it. Ads around the country are set to air tomorrow, mostly in congressional districts won by Hillary Clinton with a Republican representative in the House, including this six-figure TV and digital campaign from the liberal group Save My Care. Here's a slice of the ad targeted against Arizona Congresswoman Martha McSally. Congresswoman McSally just voted for a disastrous health care repeal bill opposed by the American Medical Association, AARP, and the American Cancer Society. McSally voted to raise your costs and cut coverage for millions. To let insurance companies deny affordable coverage for cancer treatment and maternity care and charge five times more for people over 50. The legislation does face an uncertain future in the Senate where Republicans' two-vote margin makes any controversial provision in the legislation a potential bill killer. The president just tweeted about this this morning, writing, quote, Republican senators will not let the American people down. Obamacare premiums and deductibles are way up. It was a lie and it is dead, unquote. Let's talk more about this with Dr. Tom Price. He's the secretary of the Department of Health and Human Services. Thanks for joining us, doctor. Appreciate it. Oh, thanks, Jake. Good to be with you this morning. So during the campaign, President Trump presented himself as a different kind of Republican. He said he would protect Medicaid. That's the health care program for the poor and also for people with disabilities. He said he would do that without making any cuts to Medicaid. Take a listen. I'm not going to cut Social Security like every other Republican, mm -hmm. and I'm not going to cut Medicare or Medicaid. Save Medicare, Medicaid, and Social Security without cuts. Have to do it. Save Medicaid without cuts. But according to the Congressional Budget Office, the health care bill that just passed the House would cut $880 billion over 10 years from Medicaid. Now, I know that the Trump administration is excited that Medicaid will go back to the states where they have more control and can experiment and be more efficient. But without question, $880 billion fewer dollars is a cut. How is this not a broken promise? Well, look at the Medicaid program that we have right now, Jake, and that's a program where one third of the physicians that ought to be seeing Medicaid patients aren't. And that's because there's a fundamental flaw within the program itself. So what we're trying to do is to, and, and we ask you and the American people, to imagine a Medicaid system that actually works better for patients. Medicaid is a system that deals with the, the disabled, uh, the elderly, healthy moms and kids. And yet the federal government up to this point has said to the states, you've got to treat every single one of those individuals exactly the same. That doesn't make any sense to anybody. So what we're fashioning is a system that would, be, uh, would allow the states 
states to tailor their Medicaid program to those specific individuals, thereby saving money, yes, but also making it so that they have a higher level of care, higher quality of care than they currently do. That sounds like it makes a lot of sense. Well, I know a little bit about this because my dad is a pediatrician in South Philadelphia and he takes Medicaid dollars. And one of the reasons why so many of his colleagues do not is because the Medicaid reimbursement level for doctors is so little, uh, as opposed to, for instance, the reimbursement level uh, for Medicare, which is for seniors. Why will cutting $880 billion over 10 years from the program encourage doctors to keep taking it? It sounds to me that it will actually discourage doctors. Less money, lower reimbursement rates. Well, remember what the $880 billion is off of. It's off what's called a baseline, which is what the federal government, what the Congressional Budget Office says we would spend if we just continued current law. The fact of the matter is that Medicaid spending under, under the, uh, the proposal and under the budget goes up every single year and it goes up by a factor that's great that that is equal to the uh, the cost of medical care that means that the states will have greater flexibility to provide coverage and care for their medicaid population than they do right now and that's incredibly important because as your dad sees i'm absolutely certain is that oftentimes the medicaid reimbursement doesn't cover the cost of the provision of the care for those kids that he's taking care of now imagine a system that that allowed greater flexibility so that more resources could be put to the seniors and the disabled, and appropriate resources could be put to the healthy moms and kids in a Medicaid system. That's a system that, again, works better for patients than it does for government or insurance companies. But the CBO, the Congressional Budget Office, looked at the plan that passed the House, although there were some changes to it, and said 14 million people who are on Medicaid will no longer be able to be on Medicaid. Governors from around the country, including these seven Republicans I'm about to put on the screen, they're on the record saying they're concerned about these cuts to Medicaid in this health care bill. Um, if you believe in sending this back to the states, shouldn't you and President Trump be listening to these Republican governors who are on the front lines? Oh, in fact, we have listened, and we've listened very in in intently and had wonderful meetings with Republican governors. Remember that there are no cuts to the Medicaid program. There are increases in spending. But what we're doing is apportioning it in a way that allows the states greater flexibility to, to cover their Medicaid and care for their Medicaid population. This is incredibly important. And I know that, that, that you know, the media loves to talk about the cuts that the CBO uh, uh, talks about. But again, what the Congressional Budget Office measures is spending as if nothing changes at all, as if the program is doing just fine. Thank you very much. The fact of the matter is, is that the program isn't doing just fine. And so what the President's committee is, what our commitment is at Health and Human Services, is to make certain that those individuals in the Medicaid population get not just the coverage that they need, but the care that they need. And that's what's important. Are you actually saying that $880 billion in cuts, according to the CBO, uh, however you want to talk about that not being a cut, that that's actually not going to result in millions of Americans not getting Medicaid? Absolutely not. And, and, and we believe strongly that the Medicaid population that will be cared for in a better way under our program because it'll be more responsive to them. These decisions will be made closer to them. Right now you've got Washington, D.C. dictating to the states and dictating to patients exactly what must occur. That's not how a, a healthy health system works. A healthy health system works by allowing those individuals closest to the patients themselves to be making those decisions. And from the president's perspective and our perspective, that means patients and families and doctors making medical decisions, not Washington, D.C. Well, as you know, uh, a lot of doctors don't like this plan, including the American Medical Association, which you're a member of, which endorsed you uh, to become secretary of the Department of Health and Human Services. Tomorrow, a liberal health care group called Save My Care is going to launch a six-figure ad campaign against 24 Republican members of the House who voted to uh, repeal Obamacare in this bill. The ad notes that the bill is opposed by the AMA, the AARP, the American Cancer Society. What's your message out there to someone at home who looks at that list, who watches this ad and wonders, if it's such a good idea, why are those three groups against it? Yeah, I would urge them to talk to their doctor, talk to their provider. When I talk to the docs that I used to practice with right here in, in, in Atlanta, what they tell me is that the current system isn't working for them or for their patients. We've got 20 million folks out there across this land who have, who, who have told the federal government, 
phooey, nonsense. I'm not going to participate in your program because it doesn't do what I need done. So they're paying a penalty. They're paying the IRS a fine or a penalty because the federal government is dictating to them what they don't want to do. Or they're saying, give me a waiver. Now that's a system, again, that may work for government. It may work for insurance companies, but it's not working for patients. So the system that we want is a system that works for patients and families and doctors. So talk to your doctor. Ask your doctor whether or not he or she is having challenges because of what the federal government puts in their way, the kinds of rules and regulations that make it more difficult for them to care for you. When I cared for patients, I knew that the federal government oftentimes was making it much more difficult for me to do for my patients what I knew to be best. And that's the system that we want to get away from. We want to get it in the direction of a system that works for patients. As you know, a lot of working class voters uh, went in there on, in November and pulled the lever for President Trump, having heard him say that he was going to keep their Medicaid, save their Medicaid uh, without any cuts. CBO says this is an $880 billion, $880 billion cut. Uh, and I asked you at the top, and, and I'm wondering if you could just directly answer this, because one of, the, one of the frustrations people had with how Obamacare was sold to the public is that politicians weren't straight. They didn't acknowledge that there were winners and losers. There were winners and losers with Obamacare. There were winners and losers with Trump Care as well. $880 billion, that's a cut from Medicaid. How is that not a broken promise? Well, look again, Jake, uh, the, the, the winners under Obamacare were the federal government and insurance companies. The winners under the program that we provide and that we, we believe is the most appropriate will be patients and families and doctors. Uh, the, uh, the, the, the reduction in spending that the Congressional Budget Office cites is, again, off the current law baseline. That means if we did nothing at all, if we just continued this broken program uh, for the next 10 years, how much money would the federal government spend? I would suggest to you that the American people are sick and tired of business as usual in Washington, and they're sick and tired of their tax dollars going to programs that actually don't work. We want a Medicaid system that works for those patients. We want a Medicaid system that doesn't just provide them a card and says they have coverage, but doesn't provide them the kind of care that they need. That's the distinction that I would ask them to draw. President Trump in the Rose Garden ceremony for the House passing the bill said the premiums are going to go down, deductibles are going to go down. You stand by that? A absolutely. And it will so because you increase competition, you increase choices into the system. You allow young people who are now saying to the program, look, I don't need all that. You allow them to have the opportunity to purchase the kind of coverage that they want for themselves and for their families, not that the government forces them to buy. That's a huge, huge benefit to, the again, the individual patients. It may not help the government. It may not help insurance companies, but it's a huge benefit to patients. And if you're an individual patient out there that you've got pre-existing conditions, the president and, and the Department of Health and Human Services are absolutely committed to making certain that you are able to have coverage that you want and allows you to have coverage that will care for you in a way that makes it so that you can select the doctor that you want to care for you and the place where you want to be treated. All right, we have a lot more to talk about, but I'm running out of time. So, uh, Dr. Tom Price, thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it. Thanks, Jake. Take care. Coming up, woefully inadequate, disappointing. That's what Republican Governor John Kasich is saying about this health care bill. With friends like these, can the GOP health care bill survive? We'll talk to him live next. Welcome back to State of the Union. Immediately after House Republicans passed the repealing and replacement of Obamacare with just one vote to spare, most GOP members of the House boarded buses at the Capitol to head to the White House for something of a victory lap in the Rose Garden with President Trump, where the president declared... This has really brought the Republican Party together. As much as we've come up with a really incredible health care plan, this has brought the Republican Party together. We're going to get this finished. Not so fast. 20 Republicans in the House voted against the bill, and multiple Republican senators want to write their own version, and at least seven Republican governors have questioned this version of health care reform. Can this be fixed in the Senate to bring the party together? Joining me now is Republican Governor John Kasich of Ohio. He's the author of the new book, Two Paths, America Divided or United, which will be on the bestseller list, his fourth on that list. Governor Kasich, thanks so much for joining me. Thank you. Thanks, Jake. So, Governor, you've called the House Republican health care bill, quote, woefully inadequate and very disappointing. What, in your view, is wrong with the bill? Well, first of all, Jake, in the area of Medicaid, uh, they're going to eliminate Medicaid expansion. And uh, I cover in Ohio 700,000 people now, a third of whom have mental illness, drug addiction, and a quarter of whom have chronic disease. In 2020, 
that program is frozen and people cycle off that program. Now, I don't have a problem with trying to move the Medicaid expansion, which gives an enhanced match from the federal government to a more traditional match, but you can't do that overnight. So what happens to those people? Well, they're going to go over on the exchange. Now, here's the problem with the exchange. They give you about three or four thousand dollars, a tax credit of three or four thousand dollars to buy health insurance. Now, who, what, what do you think you can buy for three thousand or four thousand dollars? Do you know what the deductible would be in that? And in addition, in addition to that, for people who have these challenges, whether it's drug addiction, mental, mental illness, or chronic disease, they've got to see the doctor on a regular basis. So how do we think that the mentally ill have the ability to pay the deductible on an insurance policy that they have that they can buy for $3,000? let say they're 40 years old. They buy an insurance policy between three and $4,000. It's inadequate. Mm -hmm. Well, let me ask and you, so sir. You uh, have you just heard you're going to have doctor, people who are going to go ahead. I'm go sorry. ahead. No, you go ahead. Sir. I was going to say you're going to have a lot of people. That, where are they going to go? That's that's a real problem, and that doesn't mean the system doesn't need to be reformed. It can be, but um, you know this was this was not great, and it's going to go to the Senate. And I I hope and pray they're going to write a much bigger bill. Look, I'm out as governor in 18 months. Okay, I'm sure there's some people out there that will applaud that. So this doesn't really affect my operation directly, except for maybe these cuts, which I'm not sure what they are. Um, but th I'm worried about the future, and I'm worried about these people who are really vulnerable. Well, let me ask you some questions that I asked Dr. Price. You just heard him a few minutes ago. One, Donald Trump promised uh, that there would be no cuts to Medicaid. This plan, obviously, uh, would reduce uh, Medicaid payments to states by $880 billion over 10 years, according to the Congressional Budget Office. Is that a cut? But that doesn't even count. But, Jake, that doesn't even count Medicaid expansion. Right. You see, come 2020, that's eliminated. And people who are on it can stay on it, but most people cycle off because they get work, their income goes up, and once they're off, they're off. They can't go back on. And I'm not opposed, again, to changing that. But you can't do it just overnight. It has to be done over a period of time. Well, first of all, is it a cut, and is this a broken promise of President Trump? Well, I'm, what am I going to start? I'm not here to really get into you know, what tr you, you do the analysis of what, what the president said and what we've done. But look, the problem is, and you pointed it out, the reason why a lot of doctors do not take Medicaid is because the reimbursement is low. And so the whole problem with what we're debating today is not just insurance coverage, because that's what we're talking about. What we're not talking about are the things that need to be done to lower the cost of medicine. And let me also tell you, I told President Trump in the Oval Office that governors need to have more authority to, to have more leverage over these pharmaceutical companies because the Democrats gave me a, a law that says I have to cover everything, every drug, whether I can afford it or not. And the fact is I have no leverage. So I said, let me exclude these high-priced drugs, give me leverage, and I'll have, be in a position to drive that cost down. That is not in this bill. The, rub, uh, the answer from Dr. Price is that this bill gives new flexibility to states. It gives new uh, flexibility to governors. Uh, it also obviously could have a big impact on, on people with pre-existing conditions in that states will be able to obtain waivers uh, and then insurance companies uh, will be able to charge okay. people with pre-existing conditions me, let, higher let premiums. Tell you. Yeah. This business of these low-risk pools, they're not funded. Eight now, billion, the $8 billion you, they're adding is not enough, you're saying? $8 billion is not enough to fund. A higher, it's, a, it's ridiculous. And the, the fact is, states are not going to opt for that. See, I think, I think the fundamental issue here are the resources. I, I want to give you exactly the numbers, but it's about half the resources in this bill that were in Obamacare. Now, I can tell you that we can do with less resources but you can't do it overnight, and you, can't, and you cannot give people a three or $4,000 health insurance policy. You know where they're going to be? They're going to be living in the emergency rooms again. So they went, I mean, they were just trying to fulfill a campaign promise, and I still say they should have worked with the Democrats. Now, if the Democrats didn't want to work with them because some of them did not, then they should have called them out. But you tell me what happens to people. Think about our listeners. What can you buy for three or four thousand dollars a year? Not, not much. And if you have to consistently visit the doctor, how are you going to pay for that? The deductibles will be so high. And again, in Medicaid, you're going to knock all these people off after 2020, which is just a few years away. 
uh, these people who now are getting covered across the country. So let me just, just, just be clear here. You are not going to seek any waivers for the state of Ohio when it comes to the requirements for insurance companies with uh, people with pre-existing conditions, when it comes to essential health benefits. You're fine with the rules as they are. I would say that I'd like some flexibility. I know there's a push to try to have some kind of a work requirement for able-bodied Medicaid recipients, and, uh, and I'll work with my legislature to, be, to respect the kind of things that they want, but there would be no reason to move to a high-risk pool because a high-risk pool is not funded. So I would just stay in the traditional program on the exchange. The problem, look, this is all going to be changed, Jake. You cannot, you can't do it this way. You can't starve the, these programs, and that's what's happening. And look, I am a conservative Republican. My Medicaid program is increasing at 3%. My per capita rate is flat. We've managed our program, but we had the tools. We had to say that if people want to stay in their own home rather than being put in a nursing home, they could do it. We had to fight the nursing home industry on that. I'm begging for some power against the pharmaceutical industries. That is one of the big, that is the biggest driving cost in my Medicaid program today. And I told the president that. And I told Gary Cohn that. And I told him we need to have some leverage. There's none in here. So I hope as the Senate looks at this, and I've talked to some senators, I, I'm also talking, by the way, my staff's talking to some Democrat governors along with Republican governors like the great Rick Snyder to see if we can get this in the right place, because the system does need to be reformed. This just doesn't get it done. On Friday, the nonpartisan Cook Political Report downgraded Republican re-election prospects in 20 House districts over this vote. Let me read you what they wrote. Quote, House Republicans' willingness to spend political capital on a proposal that garnered the support of just 17 percent of the public in a March Quinnipiac poll is consistent with past scenarios that have generated a midterm wave, unquote. Um, so I want to talk about the politics of this. We've been talking about the policy. Two of the last three presidents, Bill Clinton and Barack Obama, lost control of Congress over the issue of health care reform in no small part. As a Republican, are you worried that your party might lose control of Congress over this issue? You know, it's not something I've calculated. What I'm concerned about, frankly, Jake, is I'm concerned about how this is going to affect people who find themselves in a very difficult position. And I think, but, but for the grace of God go I, if I were in a position where I thought I was going to be able to not provide health insurance coverage to my family or to my friends, that's what I'm concerned about. I don't know how all the politics will spin out. You, you calculate that. You get your panel to talk about it. Bringing politics into this discussion is not something I have any interest in because I'm more concerned about how the policy affects real people. That's what I care about. Too much thinking about politics in Washington. Why don't we just get to it? Let's reform the system. Let's get into the issue of why health care costs keep rising so we can help your dad to have a, a more successful practice. Ohio Governor John Kasich, thank you so much for your time, sir. We always appreciate you stopping by. Jake, always good to see you. Thanks. Good to see you, sir. Coming up, a Republican congressman warns this could be President Trump's mission accomplished moment. Is he right? That's next. You are mandating people on Medicaid except dying. You are making a mandate. No, no one wants people. anybody to die. You know, that, that line is so indefensible. Nobody dies because they don't have access to health care. Nobody dies because they don't have access to health care. Congressman Raul Labrador, Republican of Idaho, at a town hall yesterday with me now to discuss health care and much more. Former South Carolina Democratic State Representative Bakari Sellers, Republican Congressman Marsha Blackburn of Tennessee, former Obama White House Communications Director Jen Psaki, and former Ted Cruz Communications Director Amanda Carpenter. Congressman, let me start with you. Nobody dies because they don't have access to health care. True? We all know that individuals have and need access to health care, and that's one of the reasons we're trying to get in this process and clean up what has happened through the Affordable Care Act and the marketplace and the narrowed networks and the lack of access because the stories that come into our office every single day will just rip your heart out. People that can't get access to the care. They've got a card, an insurance card, but the product is too expensive to use. Um, lack of access to physicians who will take it. And that is why it is essential that we work 
to fix this issue. My hope is that our colleagues across the aisle are going to come work with us to get it fixed. Bakari? And they should. I mean, yeah. I, I, I agree with your part about the heart-wrenching <laughs> stories that we're hearing and the fact that yeah. the Affordable Care Act needs to be reformed. Uh, but I think it's, it's almost perverted to say that somehow taking away insurance from 20 to 24 million people from stopping the but expansion of Medicaid. that's not a right number. Well, well, that's uh, not what, a what true is the number. number? What is the number? There are only what is 9 the million people. But, uh, and what is, Bukhari, this is How many issue. people there are going to lose insurance because of this bill? 9 million people in you don't the know exchange. That. But you don't know the, the number exchange. and the See, Medicaid the expansion. The problem is you didn't know what the number was with Obamacare. We do know the number and with no, Obamacare. You do not. The problem, no, you do the problem not. Congressman, that the American public recognizes is that you as a sitting member of Congress voted on a bill and you don't know how many millions of Americans are not going to have insurance because of it. But even more importantly, one of the things that I would and want to work on... And the lie of the Democrats, decade was the, the Obama the lie. And yeah. it's not working and it has Democrats to be fixed. Got 19 if states, we don't, we you know that there are a third of the counties in this country that right now only have one insurance provider. We know that there are people who are facing not having access to any health this insurance. Bukhari make his point. Yeah, this, 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 this yeah. doesn't help that. In fact, you're going to have people with pre-existing conditions whose care is going to skyrocket. But if you want Democrats to help to get to the point uh, that you were making earlier and many others and, and John Kasich was making, one of the things Democrats wanted to do was take this further because there are about 19 states, 18 states, which are not expanding Medicaid, which have chosen not to do that. And those people are still going without care. And we were hoping that there was going to be something enticing to those states uh, through cuts or whatever to bring those people in. And that and didn't happen. Amanda, say, let's, let's amend a bit. Before. Here's the biggest problem for Republicans and Democrats before Obamacare, post-Obamacare. Every member of Congress is now an insurance adjuster, a doctor, having to process people's health problems. It's like you're calling your member of Congress and saying, hey, look at this thing on my foot. What are you going to do about it? They have to take this out of the congressional realm and put patients in contact with their doctors. Listen, I was on Obamacare, had patients. to get out of it, and now I'm on a MediShare, and now I'm actually talking to the doctor about the price of care. We're going to keep going around about pre-existing conditions. We're going to keep going around about all the different benefits until we find a way to get patients involved in the process and we actually start lowering the cost of care. Insurance means nothing unless you lower the cost of care. Jen, one thing I wanted to ask you as a member of the Obama White House is, it seems to me, and I said this to Dr. Price, that there was a reluctance to acknowledge that there were gonna be winners and lures with Obamacare for political reasons to sell the plan, and we're seeing the same thing play out with Trump care. There's a reluctance to acknowledge there will be winners and losers. Of course there will be winners and losers, and of course there are gonna be some winners. People, premiums will go down for people who buy plans that cover fewer things, uh, et cetera, but there are also gonna be losers, and there does seem a reluctance to acknowledge that. Sure, look, I think when we look back and we think about how we sold Obamacare in the beginning, there are a lot of lessons learned. One was to sell individual pieces of it, to talk about people who would have to maybe put a little bit more skin in the game, young people, people who are healthy. But the problem is that the losers in this version of the health care bill are people who uh, need extra help. They're people who are, have disabilities. They're people ranging from people who have kids with asthma to people who have had a child. Uh, a lot of us at this table, we're, we're forced we can afford health care. But what this is really about is the people who rely on, depend on, the guarantee that, uh, pre, that coverage of pre-existing conditions uh, would help them with, that Medica the Medicaid expansion is helping people with. And that's uh, basically a different view of what health care should be in this yeah, country. And let's, let's talk about what, what's yeah. going to happen in the Senate. I'm going to come right to you. Because yeah. um, listen to Amanda's former boss, uh, Senator Ted Cruz, uh, talking about this. For seven years, the Republicans have been promising, if, if only you elect us, we'll repeal Obamacare. I, I think the consequences of failure would be catastrophic. Do you, do you, do you agree with that, Congressman? The idea that if the, if, if the Republicans in the Senate don't pass something, and then if the two bodies don't come together to pass something, that's going to be horrible for Republicans oh, in I 2018. Do I do agree with that because people are burdened by the high cost of insurance. They want this issue resolved. They have expectations that Congress is going to resolve this issue. They want a patient-centered health care system and they expect us to deliver on this and working through those expectations is important. Now I will say this, back to Bakari and Jen's point, please remember in 2010 when President Obama had the Blair House Health Care Summit, invited Republicans to come, we went and we took our ideas 
He didn't want those ideas except for pre-existing coverage and children up to age 26. But we accepted that invitation, and I think it is imperative for Democrats to accept the invitation to work with us as we look for how we're going to change and reform a health care insurance and delivery and, and I, system. I think, I think that if you look at things such as cost transparency, like you mm -hmm. were talking about, the lower cost, reining in costs of pharmaceutical drugs, if you start looking at those things which are creative but sound in health care practice, you will get Democrats to That'd buy into. That would be great. But what you I won't get Democrats to, to buy into is steadily increasing the number of pre-existing conditions that won't be covered. And knowing that you're going to put forth a plan of but high-risk pool where you don't done. fund it. And, and, and that is not being done. And Congressman, we have two, B, two CBO scores, two. We don't have one from the final bill that you all just voted on. What those scores tell us is that between 20 and 24 million people and are going to lose been, their insurance. CBO and has been so wrong on their numbers, and you know so that. Amanda, you know, let me ask you, know you know because that. we heard <laughs> you know uh, Governor Kasich talking about how he wanted uh, leverage uh, when, it com when it came to renegotiating prices, and there was nothing in here uh, that would put the pharmaceutical industry. Uh, isn't this uh, at, 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 in a position that they don't like? Isn't that an opportunity for President Trump, who badmouthed Big Pharma during the campaign? Yeah, and there's absolutely opportunity for Republicans in the Senate to work on these issues, yes. where I think they'll get a ton of traction. And so, you know, Mitch McConnell says he wants to start over. I don't necessarily view that as a bad thing. I think that's an opportunity to infuse some of these better ideas that the House didn't get around to doing as a part of that debate. I don't understand the messaging from the White House on this, saying pushing this to a point of brinkmanship over and over. I think. Republicans would be much better off if they said, listen, this is going to be a hard process. Health care is important. It may take five votes. It may take 500 votes, but we are going to get this done. All right, everyone get stay right process. there. We're going to take a quick break. Coming up, Hillary Clinton getting a little bit political, declaring herself a member of the resistance. New details on what she's planning next. If the election been on October 27th, I'd be your president. It wasn't a perfect campaign. There is no such thing. Um, but I was on the way to winning until the combination of Jim Comey's letter on October 28th and Russian WikiLeaks raised doubts in the minds of people who were inclined to vote for me but got scared off. Hillary Clinton announcing this week that she is starting her own political organization called Onward Together to help identify groups that could benefit from outside funding. What does it all mean? The panel's Back with me, uh, Jen Psaki, former communications director for the Obama White House. What do you make of Hillary Clinton's statement? What do you make of her commitment to continue to be involved in the process, calling herself a member of the resistance? Well, good for her for trying to channel her loss into something positive. I do think if you look at her comments of what she said about, how, you know, it would have been guaranteed she would have won on October 27th, we don't really know that. Was sexism a factor? Yes. Was Comey a factor? Was Russia a factor? Absolutely. But I've watched a lot of focus groups. I've watched, looked at a lot of polling over the years, and the perception of her was baked into the cake for about 10 years. I would encourage any Democrat running this year, whether they're a challenger or they're a vulnerable incumbent, to look at the focus groups that Priorities USA did. They did them in Wisconsin and Michigan. And they looked at, they talked to Trump, Obama Trump voters. And what came out of them, those focus groups, was something very alarming for Democrats, which is the perception that we are fighting for rich people, we're fighting for the 1%. And if we don't change what we're doing, if we don't listen more, we're going to keep losing. And I think that was also a factor in the race. I wonder, when you see Hillary Clinton going out there and talking about yes. um, how it's Comey's fault and how it's uh, Vladimir Putin's fault and she's a member of the resistance, as a Republican, are you happy? Does it make you excited? Like she's going to stick around I, and keep I blaming other people? As a, as a woman who is in elective office, it is dis disappointing to me. Hillary Clinton has the opportunity to role model graciousness, but she is choosing to live in stew, in bitterness, and to blame somebody else. And throughout my career, I've seen over and over again, eventually you say, this didn't work, or I didn't win, or I am sorry, and you move on. You accept things, you own it, you move on. And she is missing a great opportunity by not doing that. Listen to her, it's always somebody else's fault. Listen to her another day for the election, she would have won. So obviously what happened in 2016 is, is a, certainly a, a set of circumstances that's worth discussing and such. But it's been pointed out that when Mitt Romney lost, um, a Republican uh, commentator pointed out, 
Um, people said he was ahead in the polls, people forget, a few points uh, leading into the weeks before Election Day. And then came Superstorm Sandy and Governor Christie uh, expressing nice things about President Obama during that race. And when Mitt Romney was asked, um, is that, is, was Chris Christie's hug of Obama the reason you lost? He said, I lost because of me and my campaign. It's no one else's fault. I think those are vastly different circles. Of course they are, but it's, it's like, still, it's like, yeah, but that's, he's still that's probably, and but who, Jacob, but who knows what he was thinking fact, behind closed doors. Is, the fact is you had a foreign agent interfere and meddle in our, in, in our election. 17 different in, intelligence agencies have said it is something we've never seen before. WikiLeaks weaponized the media and e every show that I've been on went on and used those emails and, and reinforced narratives of Hillary Clinton. Uh, but to sit here and act like that Hillary Clinton didn't, didn't take response didn't take responsibility. They, they didn't have they didn't, they didn't, didn't hack, hack, they didn't hack no, no, but like, but, but, they hacked the person. Right, right. There was no hacking right. of election, election machines, they, of course. Right. So uh, I, no one's saying that. But yes, I mean, Hillary Clinton sit there and said, I take responsibility. I don't know what else you want her to do. But I would say as a former secretary of state, she should know when she stands on a stage like that and says, Russia is responsible for my losing the election. That only makes Russia all of that more powerful. It wasn't just an attack on Hillary. Let's remember they also tried to hack into Marco Rubio's campaign. And of course, WikiLeaks was spreading information. Russia TV was spreading information. That was anti-Hillary. But I have a problem with the Secretary of State making Russia, making it appear as though they controlled our election. That is a bad move. That looks bad on America. This is something that should concern both Republicans and Democrats. I believe it does. But when you politicize it that way, that doesn't help anyone. Well, that's true. And that, that relates to what we should be doing moving forward. I mean, you look at the French election and what's happening there. It's happened in Italy with the referendum. We have an election in Germany. And the fact that there are many Republicans who are opposing moving forward with the investigations, who are holding back information, should be perplexing to people. Because Putin is not a registered Republican. Right. He wants to create confusion in the United States. So moving forward, that's absolutely right. Now, we do know from the intelligence agencies and the assessment that they were trying to help elect Donald Trump. So factually, mm -hmm. there's no question it was a factor. We probably will never know. The that doesn't fact mean they won't turn on Donald Trump when the conditions are right. What we need to do is this. We need to go back and look at what happened with the Clinton Foundation and Uranium One and those ties. Why? And okay, that hasn't been investigated forward. before, right? That look hasn't been investigated before. The, we okay. know that the Russians are bad actors and they don't wish us well. <laughs> so let's agree on that and agree, yes, that, that, it should Picard. be investigated. That, that makes no sense. But let me... Of course it makes sense. Let me, let me also... Let, let, me, let me just say this. To, for people to be surprised that Hillary Clinton is a part of the resistance, I wanted to go to that. This is somebody who was a civil rights activist for a very long period of time with registering Hispanic voters, getting young African-Americans out of adult prisons. Her being a part of a civil rights movement or a struggle is nothing new. And so th this whole now that she's back on the scene, God bless her and let her do as she pleases. Got to go. Thank you so much, one and all. Great panel. Appreciate it. After the break, what's next on the Trump agenda? It's all written out on the most powerful whiteboard in America. The details are in this week's State of the Cartoonian. Coming up next. Welcome back. President Trump made a lot of campaign promises, and now we know who in the White House is trying to keep track of all of them. But what else might be on that person's to-do list? That's the subject of this week's State of the Cartoonian. He made a list, and he's checking it twice. But we're not talking about jolly old St. Nick. It's President Trump's chief strategist, Steve Bannon, who made the list. What we need to do is slap the Republican Party and, and, and if we have to, we'll take it over. This week, we got a glimpse at Mr. Bannon's office in the West Wing, thanks to a tweeted photo from a rabbi visiting the White House. I have a little thing called the war room. The whiteboard in the background of the photo caught our attention, written in black marker, a to-do list, President Trump's many campaign promises. The former head of the alt-right news website Breitbart is considered the mastermind of some of President Trump's most controversial ideas including suspending immigration from terror-prone regions. Check. Although, didn't a judge block that? Suspending the Syrian refugee program. Check. Repealing and replacing Obamacare. Half a check, thanks to the House vote this week. We're going to get this passed through the Senate. I feel so confident. And there's one big promise that has not been checked off yet, building the border wall and eventually, Bannon wrote, making Mexico pay for it. President Trump is not worried. We'll build the wall, folks. Don't even worry about it. We wonder what's on the other side of Mr. Bannon's whiteboard. Get on the National Security Council. Check, although 
He was then fired from the National Security Council. Come up with good spin for being fired from the National Security Council. Yeah, you know, I can run a little hot on occasions. Get Paul Ryan fired. Get Reince Priebus fired. Get Jared Kushner fired. Steve is a guy who works for me. He's a good guy. But I make my own decisions. I don't have people making decisions. Uh-oh. Don't get fired yourself. We'll stay tuned to see what or who gets checked off the list next week. Thanks for watching. Fareed Zakaria GPS is next.